Andy, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. This is awesome. I love uh, love hanging out uh, with product and product marketing folks. So let's get into it. Yeah, love it. Uh, for the people that don't know you, give us the two minute highlight reel of your career so far, just so people have a little bit of context where you're coming from. Sure. So uh, I started out um, in sales actually um, for like a year and a half. Like I was a working in a small town at Battle Creek, Michigan. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that town, but it's the headquarters of Kellogg. And so we had that going for us. We were Serial City. Um, but in either case, I was not uh, too keen on living there for, for too much longer into like my adult life. I also wasn't too keen on sales. And so I went through a period um, where I was like, okay, I'll go anywhere, like anywhere that'll take me. And oh, hey, college in Kalamazoo. That's awesome, Blake. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I went to a period where I was like, okay, I'm just going to like apply anywhere anywhere and if i can get into marketing that would be ideal and so mm-hmm. sent out like hundreds of applications uh and really like didn't have any idea of, like what kind of tech companies were good which ones weren't and so by a stroke of luck really the only company that um like reached out and like we went through the interview interview process and gave me a shot was zoom info and uh-huh. so uh packed my bags my wife and i had just gotten married and we uh, moved out to vancouver washington and so i started as an associate o- associate product marketing manager at zoom info mm-hmm. and um you know it was a, on a team of two at that time and so you know we were we really had our hands full the company was about 500 employees at that time we were doing everything from you know positioning messaging buyer personas product launches competitive intel enablement you know just kind of like the the classic you know, full stack PMM kind of role. But then, you know, as I'm sure many know, like Zoom Info got onto a pretty big, like, uh, uh, you know, went into like rocket ship mode, like shortly after I joined and got a bunch of new people that join, you know, a bunch of acquisitions. And um, so like what typically happens is, you know, you, um, those people on a product marketing team, you start to niche down a little bit within your roles. You're not handling every single aspect of being a product marketer. And I really enjoyed competitive Intel. And so, um, I tried to hang on to that piece specifically. And so just really tried to build up a more like formal competitive Intel program at zoom info and, uh, really yeah. worked with the sales team specifically, um, to make sure that they were winning against, uh, competitors. And uh, really enjoyed it, built what I would consider a, a solid program. And then I was like, okay, like time to do something else. And um, so I, I had an opportunity at ClickUp to essentially build the competitive Intel program from the ground up. And so that's what I've been doing for the past year and a half. So here we are. Yeah. Cool. Love it. Sounds good. Um, okay. Just to set the stage a little bit for people, I feel like competitive intelligence has become a lot more important especially for B2B SaaS companies in the past five to 10 years. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure like how many people, like I'm sure we're all familiar with, you know, these massive G2 grids or the MarTech 5,000, which is more like the MarTech like 11,000 at this point, you know, they're all yeah, super crowded. Into my mind. Yeah, it's so, it's, it's, it's so dense. It's like, it's overwhelming a little bit. It's very overwhelming. And um, it's funny. So the guy who makes, um, you know, the MarTech 5000, his, his name is uh, uh, Scott Brinker. And he actually did like a partnership article with G2. And um, they like together said um, that not just MarTech, but just SaaS in general, there's over 100,000 different SaaS products. And more than 1,000 are actually launched every single month. Now you could, you know, like, be a little bit skeptical of that and be like, okay, well, how many of them are surviving or like lasting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point of this is, you know, we're continuing to grow. There's a lot that's out there and there's more that's being built every single month. And so naturally what happens is, you know, buyers, like they, they have like infinite options essentially to, you know, figure out, you know, the, the right solution for them. And so in just what I've realized in just about every single sales conversations, unless the buyer is like a true fan of the brand, most of them are going to say, hey, like, so like, what's the difference between you and someone else? And if you don't have a good answer to that, then they're just going to do their due diligence. They're going to figure it out on their own. And regardless of whether, you know, you or your executive leadership, regardless of whether you think, you know, your product is great, like the the customer really needs to be 
in full understanding and, and, and agree with that as well. And so um, that's just what I've, I've found is that there's a lot more of those conversations happening nowadays. And so that's why I think there's a, a lot more focus on category design, competitive intelligence, mm -hmm. differentiation. We're seeing a lot of these uh, keywords kind of popping up a bit more often now. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I feel like, you know, whether or not you should focus on competitors has become not really like a tab. It's not like it's a taboo thing to like think about focusing on competitors, but it was I feel like it's almost turned into this like religious debate. Like there's, yeah. you know, there's a million articles on how to do competitive well, competitive Intel well, but then there's the flip side is there's a million articles on, you know, why you shouldn't do it at all. And just don't focus on your competitors, just focus on your customers. Like what's right. your, how do you typically like respond to that ladder group? Oh my gosh. It's like, um, what's the, there's a, there's a phrase that I'm like blanking on, but like, you can do both, man. Like <laughs> it's not like, <laughs> yeah. it's not black and white, you know, just because mm -hmm. you um, do some competitive research doesn't mean you can't also focus on the customer. Um, my friend, Alex McDonald from, uh, he's actually the competitive Intel guy over at Airtable. He has a really great kind of uh, perspective on this mm -hmm. and that's um, be competitor focused, but customer obsessed. And so mm -hmm. like just with that mindset, you know, that that really is kind of how I've tried to approach competitive Intel. You know, you're not just like obsessing over competitors uh, for just the sake of knowing like what they're up to kind of a thing. It's it's like, OK, competitive Intel is one input over a larger company strategy. Right. And a larger company right. strategy is usually defined by, um, you know, customer feedback, uh, innovation, where the market is going, just like the general direction also what competitors are doing. And so that's just one thing to keep. It's not just this random kind of, whoops, this random kind of thing that uh, we can obsess over like an isolation, just like any other piece of data. You need to look at it from multiple perspectives and, and then also consider all the other pieces of data that you're, that you're bringing in as well. And then that's what ultimately leads you into determining, okay, is this something to take action on? Yes. Okay, cool. Because of X, Y, and Z other factors, or maybe it's something that you don't need to take action on just because a competitor does something mm -hmm. doesn't mean you have to do anything. It's just, it's another program. It's another input. It's another set of data. That's how I try to look at it. Yes. I love that. I think some people hear competitive Intel and they think, oh, that means I'm just copying what my competitors are doing. But I think in fact, it, it's almost like the opposite, especially if you're not like the first, um, entrant to a market like you need to find you need to find a niche or you need to find some like differentiable val like value that you can provide that the existing uh you know incumbents don't provide uh and if you don't have at least a i don't know reasonable working knowledge of like what the landscape looks like like how could you how could you possibly you know find a way to do that um so yeah. i think that's yeah and there's, yeah. there's something that I, I think is that's that should also be added to that is, um, you know, is just being objective about what it is like your opinion on, on what a competitor is doing. And that's why I always recommend for any competitive Intel program to make it as broad of a conversation as possible. Like just because you have like an owner of a program, like just because I own the competitive Intel program doesn't mean that like I determine, you know, ClickUp's, you know, competitive strategy. What I do right. is I try to curate the conversation, organize it so that we can get as many different people's opinions as possible. Because with a company like ClickUp, right, there's a thousand people that come from a lot of different industries. Um, some of them actually came from, have been in like the work management uh, industry for years. And so they have fantastic opinions and insights about, you know, when a competitor like launches a new feature or there's a new campaign, someone does something a little bit differently. And so... <clears throat> Excuse me. So the point is, you know, with a competitive program to right track all the activity that's happening, but then also be objective about like, hey, so like, what do we think about this? Just because someone does something doesn't mean that it's automatically good, bad, this, that, or the other thing. It's up for the organization to really determine um, if it's something that is interesting or worth taking action on. And so that's what that's kind of been like a guiding principle for me is just to make sure that like you can organize that conversation so there's not like siloed uh opinions on on different things like that or that everyone can get a voice in kind of the discussion <clears throat> right yeah that it reminds me of i don't know like a good corollary is almost like customer support people also 
bring to the table like, hey, here's the kind of bugs users are encountering. It's not like that is like the end all be all of like, you know, what product is going to work on, you know, that kind of thing. Um, competitive Intel, all of these are just I don't know, pieces of data about what's going on. What do customers think about us and, you know, the landscape at large? That's so, so yeah. true. That's so true. And, you know, it's, it's similar to, um, it's similar to customer feedback, you know, it, it um, you know, <laughs> typically with competitive Intel, a lot of those folks also own win loss programs or, or if they don't, then product marketing typically will. And just because you hear lots of feedback from surveys that like, Oh, it'd be great if we had X, Y, or Z feature that doesn't mean like, okay, let's go and build that. It, it means, okay, like let's, consider that like let's put that on on the whiteboard and let's figure out like how does that align with the other things that we had planned how does this align with the other pieces of feedback that we got and so that's similar to like the competitive intel side of things you know it's just another piece of data and you need to just consider it and and make sure that you have it like uh, alongside all the other pieces of data before you can actually take action on it yes yes for sure i love that okay do do you think having a good competitive Intel muscle or like program is, is it more important depending on, I don't know, kind of like the stage of the company or, or maybe for example, if you're, if you're kind of like the clear leader of some kind of new category, is it as important for you as opposed to if you're, you're entering kind of like a, a pretty crowded market? Mm. Does that question make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I think it probably would make most sense for being in a, in a really crowded market. Um, that being said, I think that you would use a lot of the same muscles that you would in competitive Intel in a crowded market. Um, but just in a, uh, kind of, you could use those same muscles if you were like designing your own category, you're starting like kind of a new vision or like a new, yeah, I said category, but um, the, mm-hmm. the, the same actions kind of go hand in hand. You're learning like what customers are saying, like the questions that they're asking. It, and even if you are building a new category, Like you're still trying to disrupt, you know, the status quo, right? So what is that status Mm -hmm. quo that you're trying to disrupt? It it could be even as simple as like an Excel spreadsheet that you typically um, would be like disrupting or something like that. Well, then you still need to kind of use the same kind of competitive Intel muscles to determine like, okay, how do we differentiate versus that? Why would somebody spend money? on us like what's the roi of using us is it is it easier do you spend uh less time like getting the same result as you would with excel um that's Mm -hmm. those are all the same kind of questions that you have to ask yourself with competitive intel and um it all like ties back ultimately to the positioning of the product that you're working on and so um while i think that maybe like the formal kind of like competitive intel program is more common with larger companies or the companies that are in Mm -hmm. crowded markets because you you so badly need to help sales and product like inform them on like the directions that where you can stand out and differentiate because that's that's so desperately needed for those teams um but Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you that you would never kind of go about the same kind of motions or actions as you would you know building a category hopefully that makes sense yeah that's interesting yeah sounds like almost kind of like you're saying hey for for companies that are more crowded market, you're using competitive Intel, Intel almost more for like the hand-to-hand combat that like sales is doing day in and day out. Whereas for like the new category, it's more for like um, having conviction around like this new positioning you're trying to create, this new story you're trying to tell about this this category you're creating. Yeah, you know, I mean like the classic kind of... Um you know, the old way versus the new way, right? That, Mm -hmm. um, like that can be used in competitive Intel that can also be used for category design. Um, and so that, that's like a great place to kind of, uh, to start, right. And that, that is applicable in kind of both of those scenarios. And then you can kind of go from there. If you're designing a new category, it might be maybe, uh, more prevalent in just talking about like old way versus new way and like the marketing side, the product side, like that's kind of like what you're building towards versus what you said, right? Like with those crowded categories where you're kind of a, a new player in the space, it might be a bit more, um, it might be a bit more helpful on the sales side because they're going to be having those questions where people are like, oh, well, like what about A, B, and C vendors? Like why are, why would I switch to you versus them? That kind of a thing. You're going to have more of those questions. Um, but even still, right, just asking that initial like old way versus new way question, it's relevant for for both sides. Right. 
let's get into like the actual, I don't know, activity of like conducting competitive Intel. Where, where do, where do you think, like, what are the primary sources for collecting this kind of information? Like, how do you, how do you think about even just going about, you know, wrapping your head around all this stuff? Yeah. I mean, primary source, but I'm, I'm going to change that word. Not for, not from prime, not primary to just like the best sources. The best sources are like the customers of uh, like, it could be former customers of a competitor. It could also be your existing customers that have maybe um, like used that competitor before, or maybe the competitors like tried to reach out to them, you know, like those are the best sources of information. And that's why I think, you know, we, we so commonly see competitive Intel also owning win loss so that they can understand yeah. like really kind of like the buyers, like the buyer's perspective on those other tools. And so that's like primary, like that's like number one in my head. If you can have conversations with people, that's, that's, that's really the best case scenario. And by the way, you don't need to like do like build a full blown win loss program to speak to these people. Like, I think we put a lot of weight on just like a process and we need to do this before that and blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. Mm -hmm. But you know, like you can go onto a competitor's website and you can see all the logos that of their customers and whatnot. You can maybe see a testimonial from somebody like one of the, one of their customers, DM them on LinkedIn, get at like, say like, Hey, would love like 30 minutes of your time. We'll give you a hundred dollar gift card. Like that's something that you can do right now. And many people will probably say no, but like, if you like, that is just something that I think, um, like when I've done it in the past, even like just getting like two or three conversations, it is so, so informative in just understanding again, like the use case, um, like how they like landed with that competitor, what they like, yeah. what they don't like. Um, so that anyway, I think I went off on a little bit of a tangent. So that's, that's number one. Number two, you know, I think people, um, they really like discredit, like what's really publicly available. Okay. So mm. on a website, on like help desk articles, if you're really looking for like product specific, uh, competitive mm -hmm. Intel, people have publicly mm -hmm. facing help desk articles and you can skim that to figure out like, okay, how do you, how do they do this feature versus that feature? Um, another piece could be, you know, we talked about how important customer information is, or like the voice of the customer. Um, if you have call recording tools like chorus or gong, you know, you can set up competitor trackers and you can set up the tracker so that it only signals when a competitor is mentioned by a customer. So only mm -hmm. if a customer is saying, well, Hey, how do you compare with ABC? Not if a uh, if like your seller actually says ABC whatever, um, right? And you can listen to those conversations play out. You can see like okay, like what are the questions that are, our sellers are actually being asked? How are they being uh, talked about? Like what's like the NPS score? Kind of like are people typically happy with this competitor? Are they typically mm -hmm. annoyed? Mm -hmm. Why do they like them? Why don't they? Um, so anyway, I think those would be if I could give you a top three. Those that would that'd be my primary. Okay. One, yeah, okay, a couple like tactical things I'm curious about. I, I think when people think about doing like win loss, they often think about um, interviewing, yeah, interviewing deals specifically that they lost. Is there any valuable, is there any like value to even just like focusing on deals that you won or is that just something? Yeah, are you kidding me? About? I mean, that's why it's a, that's why it's a win loss program. Uh, I think there's, um, I think there's <laughs> tremendous value in that. I mean, um, don't get me wrong. I typically skew towards loss or churn when I'm like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like if I have, you know, 25 interviews, I might, you know, do like 15 on like the loss or churn and then like 10 for one. But in either yeah. case, I think it's very important to understand like, okay, like from these people who are our champions, why, like, why did they pick us over a competitor? Um, what, uh, like what was the specific use case? What were the buyer personas trying to like, just pull out different kinds of trends, right. And then going a little bit deeper Then maybe the next round of interviews, you only focus on those personas or th those specific use cases. You can kind of go a little bit deeper every single like interview round to really find like the specific trends of like, Oh, sounds like this one specific persona like we like knock it out of the park for them every single time against like these other competitors. Okay. Let's like figure out the top three use cases for this persona. Let's put it on a landing page. Let's really like optimize for that use case. And that's how you can ultimately, that's how that's like what contributes to true differentiation. 
down the line. And so 100%, that's like where the wins come from. Where the losses in churn might come from is like, okay, here's like maybe where where we need to improve. Or it could also be like, hey, um, here are a couple of scenarios where we're like not as strong. Do we want to be stronger here? This is like where the decision making comes in. Just because you mm-hmm. lose a customer for a specific reason doesn't mean like, okay, we got to go and do that thing. It's like, right. okay, we got to now maybe do some research and figure out, is that, is that worth? Is that even the like, kind of customer you like want to be winning? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, that's just, it just leads to more conversations down the road. I think right. and you already touched on it earlier. Um, you know, I think traditionally competitive Intel is all about like very quick action, right? Like competitor did it. We have to do it. Customer said it. We have to do it. Um, it's not about that right. at all. It's like the opposite. It's like, internalizing all of the different information so that you can make a really informed uh, decision at the end of the day. Right. Yes. Yeah. The goal is not to be super reactionary. It's just to be well-informed so you can make better decisions. Exactly. Okay. The reason I asked about um, interviewing deals that you've won is I was asking around what kind of problems people have doing this kind of work uh, ahead of time. One thing that came up is people find it um, they're finding it difficult to actually like get in touch with and get on calls with deals that um, they've lost. Like people are he- hesitant to do that. Um, any t- any tips are around how to more effectively kind of like book those lost interview calls? Mm. I mean, yeah. At the end of the day, it really comes down to like the quantity or like the the size of the list of people that you're reaching out to. Number one, I would, I would ask that person, like, are you incentivizing? Because yeah, to, if they're probably, <laughs> you're gonna have a hard time like booking a lost customer or a churn customer if you're, you're not giving them something else. Like why should they give you their time? Uh, so typically like I, I try to create some sort of incentive, whether that's a $20 gift card or whatever for like 15 right. minutes of their time. That's That's mm-hmm. step number one. <clears throat> Um, number two, if you if you're still finding that that's tough, another piece that people find is tough is just the bandwidth of like pulling the list of people that they want to reach out to, scheduling it, conducting the interviews, documenting the interviews, pulling the insights up. Like it's a lot of time. Like at the end, of, it's a ton of time. And so, um, at, I highly recommend that you work with some kind of a third party to do some mm-hmm. of that legwork for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, there's plenty of like third-party win-loss service providers out there. Um, mm. But, you know, the like the key there is that they understand what you're trying to get out of the win-loss program. They understand the product. They can actually have a back and forth like we're doing right here, right? Like this is a conversation. Yeah. It's not just like, hey, question, answer, question, right. answer. You know what I mean? Those are, that's yeah. like the really key, uh, key thing about like the third-party win-loss providers that you have to make sure that is, is solid. Um, and They're so like those, getting it, getting those are the details. Yeah, exactly. And so th- those are like the two keys that I would try to dig into if you're having trouble booking the loss interviews. Okay. When you do get on these interviews, are there any specific questions that you feel like are like really high generate a lot of like good signal? De- define like good signal, like just like that you can pull like, insight out of or. Yeah, that are like good bang for your buck questions. Like what, yeah, what are the kinds of questions that I really want to make sure that I'm asking when I get on these Mm. interviews? I have a, I have like a list that I could, I'm sure I could like send this group. Um, And I don't want to do it like, uh, I don't want to like, just uh, like do like a kind of like a, a bad answer, but like off the top of my head, probably just something along the lines of like, hey, how did you hear from us? Like what like led to this conversation in the first place, right? What was the mm-hmm. use case? Um, and then like maybe what felt, if this is still loss, are we talking about loss right now? Yeah. Or is it any? Uh, if, it's, if it's loss, then yeah, like what, like where did it fall down? Like, was it just like in the evaluation? Like um, you'll find that in a lot of cases, actually, um, some people are really, were really happy and like wanted the the deal to get done. But for some like political reason, like maybe like got a new CRO or like budget shit. Hey, like we're in the middle of a recession. So like, you'll find that there are some kind of like outside indicators where it's like, oh, we didn't like really like, you know, lose to a competitor. I mean, the competitors, I guess, technically like budget or something like that. I hate those conceptual answers, by the way, but you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) yeah, um, like those are kind of like 
like if you can like learn like hey what caused the deal to like pause or like slow down Mm -hmm. then that's like really like where you can get into the meat of like is it a sales issue is it a product issue like what did we like just like not meet expectations based off the marketing that you saw um yeah that's probably like the most important one i guess now that i think about it yeah yeah i was gonna ask you know it seems like a lot of people probably see losing you hear a lot about people losing deals to like no decision which means like the the prospect ended up not using something at all like what is there to glean from that yeah that's a great question um i mean number one i think that that's and i I hate like blaming like one specific department for one thing but i think that that is one area where like hopefully sales can reach out a couple of times and maybe like learn, like, even if it's like the last ditch effort and you're saying like, Hey, just letting you know, like, sounds like you're not interested right now. Could you just like, let me know like what's happening on your end to that? Did you end up going with someone else or like, is it like a budget thing, whatever. Um, And then hopefully you can get that filled out a little bit more. But that being said, like some people just straight up don't respond. And there is like very little that you can do about it. And so that's typically what I'll uh, try to dig into a little bit more, just depending, right? So like if you're building a win-loss program, um, it, what I try to like lean into more are the deals where <clears throat> there is a true loss reason. You know, you can kind of like, okay, we're going to interview 20 people who we lost against competitor A, right? That's like one kind of pattern. You can stick with that. You can learn a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. But maybe it's going to be, hey, we want to do a bunch of interviews for high like like high ARR deals, like deals over 50K mm. ARR, mm-hmm. regardless of loss reason. Like we just like want to hear from these people. Um, mm. That might be like a place where you could like dig in a little bit more and see if there's like any kind of trend like with those deals that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, if there if it was lost for no good reason kind of a thing. Um, right. I don't know if I would ever like just like stick with the deals or like focus on deals where it was like, where there wasn't a clear loss reason. I would try to, like stick with like some other more tangible attributes of the opportunity, if that makes sense. Yep, totally. Yeah, obviously I'm very new to this, but even the idea of like, oh, let's, you know, focus on a segment of deals. I'm sure you could yep. probably just helps with like, I don't know, pattern matching or- Oh, 100%. Mean, off kind of yeah, you don't wanna, yeah. if you only have, and I keep saying 20, like, you know, you might have a program where it's like you have 50 or 100, interviews that you're doing but like if you have 20 interviews you don't want them to to all be different right like that's not really the way to analyze any kind of data there needs to be some kind of similarity between the opportunities it could be a persona a use case deal value it could be like wall to wall versus like for a single department depending on the product that you use and so that's really like that's that's key like make sure you're doing that if you're if you're building out a program and you have like a set number of interviews that you're trying to go through because that'll really help focus or like narrow in on the insights that you glean. Yep. Okay. Okay. Switching gears a little bit and then we can get into questions, but uh, competitive Intel feels like it can kind of fall into the same trap that a lot of other like, like customer research projects or even like positioning exercises fall into, which is like a team goes and they spend a bunch of time putting together this stuff. And it ends up kind of going to like die in the depths of, you know, notion or confluence. How, what kinds of things can we do to make sure that like the learnings from these programs actually get shared and used? Oh my God. You just got to get in front of people. (laughs) You got to be like consistent and talking with different people, sharing new things. Um, I think like really like, it's not like a documentation issue. It's like people um, are afraid that they're going to be bugging other people. Or they're going like they're going to annoy people, and mm-hmm. like if you own the competitive Intel program, you got to be like out in front. You got to be leading the charge. You got to be, you know. I'm sure most companies have weekly or monthly standups. Try to get a recurring mm-hmm. segment, those standups, so that you can talk through what's new. Um, you know, I, I think I talk about it in the course. Um, you know, the different ways that you can kind of get in front of people. You can have a newsletter. You can have a Slack channel where you're constantly sharing different insights um just those are just a few ways but i feel like that's like whenever i look at successful competitive intel programs versus the ones that aren't successful the big difference is the person who owns the program just not being willing to consistently get out there 
and and talk with people and make sure that they're informed. Um, it's it's mm-hmm. so much more just like, all right, we made some battle cards, we're good. You know what I mean? And like that's definitely right. like if I if I was to do like an old way versus new way of competitive intel, then uh, old way was like you know stuffy battle cards. New way is just like consistent insight, always on, always adding new. Um, new things that you learn from win loss interviews into these assets, talking with sales, talking with product, like just consistent, consistent communication. That's really the big thing. Yeah. The newsletter thing you mentioned is interesting. Tell me like, what's a good, like, what's a good like format? What's a good cadence? What's like the kind of content that you go in there? Yeah. Um, so the way I have it built out right now um, is in a ClickUp doc. And so um, on the front, there's like an executive summary and, um, you know, in ClickUp docs, you can have kind of sub pages. And so each page I have dedicated to different departments. And so you might have one for sales, marketing, uh, and HR, let's say and product. And so this is going to be a lot. I'm going to try to remember everything that I, that I put into the newsletter, but I do this every month. It takes roughly like eight ish hours per month. Uh, and, um, so in the sales, you know, I'll pull together all the competitive win loss data for the month. And so how often are we losing against this competitor to that competitor? How does that look over the past six months? I'll, you can pull that from Salesforce. Another one will be how often uh, competitors are being mentioned in chorus calls. So again, those trackers that I mentioned earlier, you can get a sense for, oh, okay, these competitors are getting mentioned more than all of those other ones, which probably indicate, you know, importance or relevance. Again, six month period of time. It'll also share any new like enablement assets. So a new one pager, a new battle card, like that's where I'll position that. Um, On the product side, um, you know, for I'm lucky because I'm in a product led growth industry. And so release notes are very public. And so you can and and you can also like jump into different like competitors tools. You can create kind of a free trial and you can see like what competitors are doing. So on the product side, you can uh, like just give insights that you see from the release notes or if you like record like a loom of oh here's like how they do this kind of a thing um then like that's typically what i'll put on the product page on the marketing page um i'll do website visitor traffic again all the like with our competitive landscape and you can do this for free using a tool like similar web um just to kind of get mm-hmm. a sense for who's uh what, what website traffic looks like and i'll also do uh g2 review kind of comparisons and so mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. Uh, I've I've just found that G two is a is a really solid uh way to get a sense for like, are they investing into marketing at all? And like if if they are, then like what is the like consensus from their users? And so you can you can do that in your G two profile, like just getting a sense for like okay, like this company got a hundred new reviews this month. Oh, they this this company got eight hundred. Sounds like this is a really big investment for them right now. Um, again, month over month for six months. And then HR, I'll do like any kind of um, layoff news, any kind of executive changes. And I'll also do um, just employee growth. So on LinkedIn, if you have LinkedIn Mm -hmm. premium, um, if you go to a company profile under the insights tab, you can see like a running like 12 month overview of of a company's employee growth. So put that into like Mm -hmm. an Excel table or whatever. And you can kind of get a sense for, oh, okay, like this company is growing a lot. That's awesome. Like, okay, that they're clearly like doing well if they're if, if their employee base is growing. Or oh, like I, it seems like they're kind of teetering out. Like you know, maybe they're holding off on hiring. You can get it's a pretty good proxy for especially like private privately held businesses, like how right. they're trending. Yeah. So that will be that will go in the HR one, and then yeah, that main one will be like an executive summary, like the main page of this mm-hmm. doc. And I'll just kind of put like the the best of and just like a couple short sentences because, you know, um, it's a lot of information. And right. the worst thing that can happen is you write all that down, you spend eight hours and then people are overwhelmed and they don't look at it. And so right. having some kind of summary of like the most important information mm-hmm. so that like a busy CEO or someone can read it, um, that's really important too. So that's the newsletter and I do it every month. And I'll post it in our uh, competitive Intel Slack channel at here check it out. And then I'll do like a summary, even in my message of like, here's what this newsletter like has, you know, all of this is there's like some marketing aspect to it where you're like kind of teasing like little like breadcrumbs of like interesting stuff so that people click into it. Otherwise, it's just a newsletter. It's boring. You know what I mean? Like, 
yep. who, who gets excited to read another like department newsletter? Like nobody. And so you have to, you kind of have to jazz it up a little bit. Yeah. One thing you do well, and I think the reason that people are generally not super psyched to read a, like a department newsletter is it doesn't feel like it's like written for them. Like it's almost it's kind of crazy to think that you could write, you know, one, one newsletter and that everyone at the company would find it equally um, as interesting. So the way that you like segment things out like that, I think is an, an awesome idea. And um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, okay. You'd mentioned G2 and Captera. Do you find reviews on those are actually like sources of good info or are they certainly like companies are always like fishing for their customers to leave good reviews on G2 and Captera. Like, is it, yep. is it valuable info or is it, is it so gamed at this point that it's kind of, you know, there's like totally a, a game. Piece. There's, a, there's totally yeah. a game. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. This is another good one, by the way. Um, yeah. Okay. The, uh, I'll, I'll use all like, uh, it, honestly, I don't use Captera much. It's really G2 and trust radius for us. But um, okay. I mean, you, what I will do when I'll go through G2 there's, there's kind of two aspects. There's the actual review generation side or like acquisition side, which is more of like a marketing play, right? Of saying like, oh, we have 4.7 out of five stars, 800 reviews, just so you can say that and you can get the badges, whatever. And that's like really like, as a competitive Intel person, you can use that to just say, okay, they're investing a lot in marketing and user reviews. Like that, that's just one kind of insight. The second insight is the actual review content themselves, which is what you're mm -hmm. asking about. And there's really no other way. I mean, maybe there's, I'm sure there's actually going to be like some sort of like AI tool what that you can use to kind of like ingest this information. But like, I've had to do it kind of the old fashioned way. I'll manually kind of comb through the reviews. And you're so right. There will be some where it's like, this interview is five stars. There's like one sentence saying they love it, whatever. Okay. No insight really there. Um, there could also be like a one star review where it's like, this tool sucks. And that also doesn't give you any information, but there also might be some, some ones that are like, you know, any kind of star rating and really like somebody took the time to really talk about their experience. Um, in G2 and in trust radius, I believe you can type in specific keywords, which will filter out all of the reviews and you kind of get a sense for like, okay, maybe I'm, I'm really interested in like, I don't know, this comp, this competitor's dashboards. Like what are people saying about their mm -hmm. dashboards? And then so type that into the review section and then it'll filter and show you all the reviews that mention dashboards. Okay, cool. Um, and then you can kind of like, as you progress, try to figure out different other keywords so that you can speed up the process. Um, but, um, and also I, I don't mean to like keep on pushing towards like the, the playbook, but in the course, I also show like kind of like a different way that you can like ingest um, all of like these kind of uh, reviews and then all and like put it into almost like a visual so that um, mm -hmm. like you can present it to like executives or someone on the product side and say like here's like all of like the the strengths of this competitor based on user reviews that I personally like look through here's all of the here's all the weaknesses and so then you can have a conversation based on that yeah that's interesting you're saying almost like a graph of like um, like, oh, you know, X percent of people are, are saying ease of use is their strength versus, you know, X percent of people are saying, you know, some other aspect is their strength. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's interesting. if you have like kind of like a pie chart that like puts mm -hmm. that all, all together, it just makes it really easy. Again, a, another job of the competitive Intel person is to do some of like that, uh, like really tough, like manual work, but then condense it into an easily digestible like visual presentation something so that anybody can jump in and really understand like what's happening and you can have a conversation out of it yeah okay uh let's see one other thing then we'll get into questions you'd mention uh mentioned battle cards um what's a quick way to do this uh, number one overrated thing about battle that people do on battle cards and number one like underrated thing people do on battle cards oh this is a good one okay uh an overrated thing that people do with battle cards um hmm. probably just put as much information as they can as they can think of in them um they don't think about the audience again we keep going back to like condensing thinking about the audience um if you put just like paragraph after paragraph on even if it's like good information uh it's not going to be super actionable for a salesperson 
And so what you yeah, need to do no is way like take, people are reading through. All, no, through no. I mean, like you have a hard time even getting them to like, you know, use a specific one pager or, or like a specific talk track. You're not going to get right. them into a battle card and using this, these talk tracks if they're like paragraphs long. And so what I always try to do is, uh, and I guess this could go like to the underrated side of things is like actually like play the part of the salesperson, go to the battle card and like think to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a salesperson now. My prospect just asked me, how am I different from the whatever competitor of the battle card that I'm working on? And then, you know, typically a, a, um, a battle card will consist of like a quick dismiss, which is like three to five sentences mm -hmm. that will like uh, put the value back on you, will kind of dismiss the competitor. There's also kind of like strengths and weaknesses where like maybe like probing questions that highlight your strengths. Um, and mm -hmm. also like kind of like, um, like ways that you can kind of defend against maybe things that your competitors will commonly like accuse you of in either case play the part of the salesperson and then try to like figure out like okay someone just asked me like how do we differentiate from abc okay i'm going to the quick dismiss read it do you sound like a robot do you like is that is that interesting like like will would that right. help do you think like really be objective about the work that you did same with like right. uh someone saying like hey well like so like how are you better than than so and so give me a few things and then like you can go to the strength section, like ask more clarifying questions and then be like, oh, OK, well, well, yeah, for them, it's more like this. For us, like we found that like a common thing that customers will say about us is ABC, whatever. That's one way. Another way, if uh, you're not good at acting, is uh, just, you know, pretend that your CEO is looking at your battle card and are they going to be happy? Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, all CEOs, all founders all CROs, whoever, they're all going to be very opinionated about competitive strategy, about, um, about like differentiation, you know, like they, they, they're, they're so passionate typically about, about competing and about compet They don't want to lose. And so mm -hmm. like put yourself in their shoes a little bit and like think, okay, now objectively, I, like I put this battle card together. This is for our top competitor. Would, would I be okay if our CEO looked at this? Like, would he agree or, or she agree? Um, or would they be like, hey, like, no, nah, this needs like way more work. Like you need to do a lot more in order to make sure that this is actually actionable and accurate. Those are a couple yeah. different ways that you can, that you can make sure that the battle card is in good shape. Cool. All right. Let's yeah, run up on time here. Blake's going to drop some questions and they'll fly up here on the screen. I'll read them out and you can take a crack at them. All right. Sander asks, can you walk through the process of asking people to interview, won or lost? Mm. Um, so if you're doing like a formal win-loss program, right, just building out kind of like a, you should have a sequence for one, uh, like your one targets, a different sequence for your mm -hmm. lost targets. Um, what I try to do, and uh, it, so like there's a tool called Lavender, which will tell you mm -hmm. like, it's like an AI tool for writing emails that uh like your goal is to get a response and mm -hmm. so what i'll do is i'll put together an email that's like pretty much requesting like whatever the one or lost interview and then i'll overlay lavender on top of it and it'll give you a score that is you know like you know a 90 out of 100 <laughs> like oh that's a, that's really good you know and it'll and it kind of guides you into telling you like oh this sentence needs to be a bit shorter uh this is a run-on sentence mm -hmm. like oh you're using a funky word here uh, because now at this point it's not as much about competitive intel. Like you're playing kind of the sales game. You're trying to get somebody to respond to you. You're trying to get them to book a meeting with you. And so right. Lavender is primarily a tool for sellers, but that's that's how I typically will approach uh, doing the outreach. Otherwise, like if it's mm -hmm. not the formal win-loss program, I'll just send a DM on LinkedIn, keep it super short. Hey, saw so you're a customer of so-and-so. Would love to like learn a little bit more about that. I would love to offer you $100 for 30 minutes of your time. Something like that. It doesn't have to be a hundred dollars, yeah. but you know what I mean? Kind of a thing. Just right. keep it short, yeah. sweet. That's, that's the, that's the uh, advice I would have. Okay. But you're saying you should per like personally reach out, like don't tie this into like your, you know, like your marketing automation stuff. Oh, um, well, so you can, I mean, um, I've done it both. I've done it both ways. Um, if it's a really large list, then maybe tie it like into like that might be something where you need to talk with like your ops team on like best practices for something like that. Um, mm -hmm. 
but you like in a lot of your marketing automation tools, you can have it still like say that it's from you, or it could say that it's like from maybe like a VP or like, you know, even like a mm -hmm. CEO, we've had that happen before where like you like lose a deal. Then here comes like the automated email from the CEO. Right. And uh, it says, Hey, we'd love to like book some time with you, like to talk through your experience, but it's really like, and, and you're really booking like the time to talk with me or like the third party provider. And again, it's like a sales game. You got to get like the most imp <laughs> important person like at the company to try to get that response. Yeah. Right. Of course. Yeah. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Oh, I should have another one here in just a sec. Ian Caldwell asks, how do you suggest getting an understanding of a competitor's pricing or even a pricing model if they don't really publish it on their website? Talk to the customers. Just talk to, talk to existing talk customers. Talk to the customers. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, yeah. it, or like do the chorus calls. I mean, so the, um, mm -hmm. the tricky thing is even with like PLG companies where they all put pricing on their, on their site, you're really, mm -hmm. um, they'll still hide like the enterprise pricing. And then even right. then, like the enterprise pricing, there's discounts and all that kind of stuff. And sure. so if you really want to dig deeper, like you're going to have to, like you, you have to talk to different like customers, former customers, um, people mm -hmm. like that have experience speaking with them. And then you'll kind of get a sense for, oh yeah, like, you know, they gave me like a list price of like $52 per license. But then, you know, like when I balked at that, they gave me like a 20% discount uh, or something like that. But also like the other piece too is, um, it's not just about price all the time. Sometimes understanding, okay, they might not give you a discount on price, but they might give you different features for free, or they might give you a full year of like a CSM and, or like, you know, white glove onboarding or something like that. Those are also really important to, to know, but you can't, they're always so, I mean, with sales at this, at this point, it's always like so different in every single deal, like at different times of the year. Um, and so that really the only way of figuring that out is if you talk with different people that are close to that situation and, and you put together kind of like a, a graph of some kind of uh, just to like put all that data together. Cause it's not just going to be like a straight cut. Like I'm just looking for enterprise pricing and that's it. Like that's not helpful at the end of the day. You need a lot more information. Right. Do you ever do like the secret shopper thing where you pretend you're, from a company don't do that buy. don't yeah don't it, like i mean like i guess i don't know there's like companies that do offer that um mm -hmm. but i think there's well so hold on um i think there are some companies where like you can hire them and they're like third party like research firms um mm -hmm. and i don't i don't really honestly know like how i feel about that to be honest but what i try to do is you know if you, if, yeah, if you want to sign up for like a, a company's uh, you know, email list, sign up with your personal, like your personal email or like your company's email. To be honest, like you'd be surprised or like joining webinars, you'd be surprised like how often like you can still get in and just like see that stuff. Um, right. Obviously, like maybe you won't be able to like get a demo with somebody specifically, but yeah. that's okay. Like you can talk to the people who have gotten demos and that's that's fine. And the, honestly, in that case, it's sometimes even better, right? Because you're getting the perspective of, of a customer or of an actual buyer and not you who is biased. Your, um, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. How did, uh, James asks, how does competitive Intel change over the size and growth of a company? Mm. Yeah. Um, I think kind of similar to how product marketer, like that job changes, you know, you start out kind of doing a little bit of everything. And then you niche down and you do like different like sub functions of product marketing. It's kind of similar with competitive Intel. Uh, I've seen companies, you know, once you establish that competitive Intel program, the CI person will be responsible for like the research, all the competitors and the enablement. And then as you grow, you might get another couple of folks who can join and maybe one person is responsible for win loss and that piece of the program. Another person might be responsible for just like maybe, you know, as you grow, as a company grows, typically what will happen is you, you might have like different kinds of products, right? So like you have uh, like Zoom, like Zoom Info is a great example, right? So it was initially just kind of like this one platform and then they made four. They made Zoom Info for sales, for marketing, for operations and recruiting. And so each of those tools have different competitors 
different use cases. And so you probably at that point, you know, you might have thousands of employees. So ah, probably best to have some sort of competitive Intel person to take one or two of those and then another competitive Intel person to take the other two because they're so different. Right. And so that's, that's typically what I see. Nice. Okay, cool. All right. I think that's all we got time for today. Just want to say thanks again to Andy for your time and thanks everyone else too, for coming out and sharing your questions. Um, Okay, Andy, you actually have a course on competitive Intel. Uh, can yes. you give us a, kind of the quick pitch of that? Yeah, sure. So, um, right, I put together a, a course called Competitive Playbook. It was about a year ago. And um, I did it because I really wanted to just kind of like put pen to paper. Here are all the things that I did to build a competitive Intel program from scratch. And, um, you know, used a lot of examples from my time at Zoom Info, um, also my time at ClickUp things that worked, things that didn't work. It's about 90 minutes. I wanted to make it like pretty like succinct, something that you could like get through in like an afternoon or a morning or whatever, and then you could start taking mm -hmm. action on. And so it's a uh, competitive playbook.com. You can see kind of a little bit more information there. And I, I haven't done the pro, I haven't input the discount code yet, but if you want to buy it and you're, and you're here right now, just use the code launch notes to get $50 off launch notes. Cool. Um, yeah. just give me like five minutes to go into Gumroad and like add <laughs> that discount code. But then, you cool, know, no, like yeah, no. after five minutes, I'll, I'll make sure that that's all set up, but yeah. Yep. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Uh, cool. And one last reminder, these events are, uh, you know, part of the launch awesome community. Blake's going to drop a link in the chat to join right now. If you're interested in hearing about future events and just kind of hopping in the discussion, Andy, thanks again for being here. Where can folks find you to connect? Oh yeah, find me on uh, LinkedIn, just Andy McConnor Bicknell. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, actually, probably don't follow me on Twitter. I, I like don't have a growth strategy there. I just tweet stupid <laughs> stuff. Um, TikTok though is Healthy Competition at Healthy Competition. Yeah. Also have a podcast cool. called Healthy Competition. Also have a community called Healthy Competition. So you know, I, I, but I yeah. post about all that kind of stuff on LinkedIn. So that's probably the number one. Dope. Cool. Well, everyone check them out. And yeah, I can attest. Yeah. The, the podcast, I listened to a ton of episodes doing research for this and it's great. So congrats oh, cool. on Appreciate all that. that there. Thanks, yeah. Steve. Yeah, for sure. So alrighty. Well, that's all we got time for today. Thanks guys. And we'll see you next time. Later. Thank you.